While the DEA investigated, Emory continued to fund the legalization movement. The court exceeded its authority like a way a lot, and I want to appeal it to the Supreme Court. Get in touch with me because I will finance that appeal to the Supreme Court. And to speak out. But Emory's strategy also involved a change of message. It was a message that began at about the time that Emory left Freedom Party in 1990, and the reason for that change was implied in the very first issue of Emory's Marijuana and Hemp newsletter. There, he explained that, before leaving Canada in 1992, he had spent years and a quarter of a million dollars advocating an abstract moral concept, individual rights. But all of that effort and expense did not give him the short-term political results he sought. He had left for India very angry and very disappointed at that time, that his fellow Canadians didn't seem to care about individual rights. In May of 1994, in the very first issue of his Marijuana and Hemp newsletter, Emery laid down a set of concrete, observable allegations of fact concerning cannabis itself and the prohibition of it. One million Canadians smoke it. It is part of North America's heritage, and it is used in many cultures. It is a large part of the economy. It is safe and harmless. It provides medical benefits. It provides environmental benefits. It has industrial uses. Pot is better than alcohol or tobacco. At the same time, prohibition has caused the filling of our prisons and has caused the rise of organized crime in a black market. These assertions would be the mainstay of his repertoire for years to come. This was not a list of abstract principles like individual rights, but of easily perceivable, concrete allegations of fact. Whether one's decision-making typically involved long-range considerations and the application of abstract principles, or whether one's decisions were governed only by the whims of the moment, one could, without much difficulty, appreciate and hold an opinion about the truth or falsity of the allegations of fact set out in Mark's list. As Robert Metz observed just before Emery left Canada, dropping the advocacy of broad moral and political principles of general application was a dramatic change for Emery, who had condemned his fellow businessmen in the 1980s for making non-essential, non-philosophical arguments of their own for opening their stores on Sundays. At, At the time he was still campaigning for Sunday shopping, he was making very clear to everyone that the principle at stake was everyone's freedom of choice and private property rights. In fact, that was largely due to all the influence around here because we would only market ourselves on those particular points. The marijuana laws, the issue is prohibition. Prohibition of a substance that I think a lot of people would like to agree with him should not be prohibited in a free society. And yet he has alienated a lot of those people who would support him. In, because of the way he's advocated it. And he not only advocated that a person should be free to smoke marijuana, but that a person should smoke marijuana, by gosh. Every Canadian should smoke marijuana in their lifetime. And that's a big difference. You know, that's, uh, that's beyond uh, the moral purview of choice. That's when you're starting to get into advocating the various things themselves. Because the only morally justifiable reason to break on, this is very important, and I'm going to return to frequently, is because it violates the peaceful and honest exercise of individual rights. There are no other reasons to flagrantly violate a law. You could not eat or consume cannabis fast enough to kill yourself. We've had so many periods of unemployment in the rural parts of British Columbia that if it weren't for marijuana, a lot of those places would be ghost towns. And that's what happens. We get Alzheimer's when the cannabinoid receptor in our brain begins to wither away. But if you feed it with just three cups a day, three little jokes a day, you'll feed your cannabinoid receptor and you'll never get Alzheimer's. Marijuana makes everything fun. It also makes you drive better. These are the very same non-philosophical justifications that are used to keep the Sunday closing laws intact. Marijuana now accounts for a significant increase in emergency room visits, up 176% since 1994, which surpasses heroin emergency care and emergency department. The revenue that you would get from having um, tens of millions of more uh, uh, marijuana users is going to be offset by the cost it is to society, the cost not only in addiction treatment, uh, but also the lost uh, productivity of those individuals. The danger that we're talking about here is the growing evidence that the use itself in individuals prior to any symptoms may be triggering and may be worsening and maybe and certainly looks like it's increasing the risk of the onset of mental health problems and uh, that's why they get in the car when they're high that's why they get in the car with a driver who is high that's why they uh, get themselves into trouble and don't realize until it's too late in many cases marijuana can lead to depression and foster suicide Metz's assessment was correct Emery was no longer advocating individual rights that make prohibition wrong He was advocating cannabis itself. 
But unlike the store owners he had condemned in the 1980s for the non-philosophical arguments they had raised with respect to Sunday shopping, Emery was not actually trying to convince people of the truth of his arguments. He had already rejected attempts to win over people with arguments about facts. Yes. I've got to challenge this business about facts being important. Emery's purpose in listing what he would call the benefits of marijuana use was not to change people's minds so much as to win the loyalty and trust of cannabis users. The facts he listed were true, but they were also the kind of positive facts his largely cannabis-using audience was happy to hear him list. Let's face it, the most brilliant people in our society are the marijuana smokers, and the evidence exists, the evidence exists in every walk of life that the most creative geniuses are marijuana smokers. And I offer a test to anybody who's Divide your CD collection into two places. Put the people who have smoked marijuana and recorded on one side, and then put the people who have not smoked marijuana and recorded on another side, and then you have to choose which one of these two collections you would keep if you were on a desert island. And I assure you, if you get rid of the Hendrix, the Beatles, the Stones, the Who, the Doors, and every other major pop, rock, jazz, blues band who smoke pot, you will end up with Pat Boone. <laughs> and we're not so sure about him. And while building goodwill with his cannabis constituency, he was equally committed to demonstrating the hypocrisy of the government's arguments. I've never seen anybody pathologically have cannabis as the cause of death. It's never happened. I've always waited for it. You know, because if there was one example of somebody who got cancer of the lung from marijuana, every government doctor would have that holding up and a big poster would be everywhere and we'd see this kind of thing all over the place. But there doesn't exist any such thing in science or nature. There is no people dying of marijuana. And look at what's legal. 12,000 people die of alcohol in this country every year from out and out alcohol toxicity. Not to mention all the people that kill themselves in cars when they're drunk, that get into fights when they're drunk, that draw a gun when they're drunk, that get into bar brawls when they're drunk, that get hit their wife when they're drunk. I mean, alcohol is implicated in so many major violent crimes. And every night, I watch this around the corner, the Canby Pub, around the corner from you. Every Friday and Saturday night, there's people lying flat out in the gutter. I can't believe it, adults. Just couldn't make it past what they're just lying in the gutter, talking up there. There's vomit all over the place. There's young, there's people fighting and squabbling. And it's a terrible scene of, of depredation, really. And multiply that by 10,000 locations across Canada every Friday night. And that's, that's all legal. That's all legal. And I've never seen the head of Molson's Brewery, or for that matter, J.R. McDonald Tobacco, they both make over a million dollars a year as the CEO, never brought to court to account for the 40,000 people that J.R. McDonald Tobacco kills every year in this country. 40,000. Tobacco, legal, kills 40,000. Alcohol kills 12,000. Responsible for unprecedented amount of carnage. Why stop there? Peanuts kill 125 people every year in North Britain. It's not a lot, but it's way more than weed, and peanut farmers aren't being rounded up. As Emery was making it clear both to marijuana users and non-users alike, the harmfulness of marijuana is not the government's actual reason for prohibiting marijuana. Because if harmfulness were the government's reason for banning marijuana, they would have banned more harmful substances like alcohol and tobacco, too. By pointing out the government's hypocrisy, Emery showed that the government was lying. More to the point, Emery showed that the government is a liar. A liar with guns and prisons on its side. A liar with guns pointed at cannabis users. Emery's non-essential, pragmatic arguments were the means appropriate to his end, harnessing people's emotions, causing people to distrust, despise, and most importantly, to reject government altogether. We have been made enemies of the very people we pay taxes to keep afloat, and it's time we turned around and told them, fuck you. <laughs> to Emery, the resultant anarchy would be freedom. Emery has also received criticism from the anti-government libertarian movement to which he turned after leaving Freedom Party. In 2003, Jack Layton, leader of Canada's New Democratic Party, the NDP, appeared on Emery's POT TV station to seek the support of Emery's marijuana movement. The moment that you create a legalized environment, then everything becomes somewhat more regularized. I liken it very much to the old prohibition laws and what happened in those days. And it's time to get out from under it. My visits to, uh, uh, to Amsterdam and uh, other cities uh, where there's a more flexible attitude 
prove to me uh, that uh, this is absolutely the way to go. We'd be more than happy to endorse all the NDP candidates if, if this was the kind of aggressive policy they were pursuing. It would be great to have you join the party and uh, prepare us to move forward with a, with a victory there. I wish you all the best of luck, Mr. Layton. I uh, hope we can hear lots about you and the marijuana issue in the months ahead. Righto, you will. At the federal level, I, there's a bit of a strange thing going on because I've been telling everybody uh, to support the NDP because I think the key thing is, is we're not loyal to a party. We're loyal to the movement. And Jack Layton has come to my home. He's filmed it. He said he believes in legal possession, legal distribution. You can't really get better than that if you're looking for someone who's going to represent those views in Parliament. So I believe we should all support him in the election. And let's try and get as much clout in Parliament as we can. Layton's NDP is an openly collectivist and anti-capitalist political party, whereas Emery, then as now, built himself a libertarian capitalist. Many libertarians of various political stripes were puzzled by Emery's support for the NDP. A lot of the people I know who, are, who talk about you and who are big friend, like fans of yours are the sort of collectivists and leaders yeah, right. that Anne Rand railed against and yeah. despised. How do you feel about the sort of people who you come, where you come from a tradition where these are like the embodiment of evil who like stand up and talk about how great you are. Everything to me is directional. As long as it moves towards liberty, I don't really care. It doesn't matter if you're the NDP, the Greens, the Conservative Liberal. If I meet you and you want to join me in advocating a movement towards liberty in any specific issue, you're welcome to join me. I want a big tent. So what's best for the movement? What's best for the movement is to bury any ideological differences. I mean, after all, I'm a libertarian. You wouldn't typically find me drawn to supporting uh, the new Democratic Party, a considered social democratic, you know, socialist party possibly. But for me, it's more important to bury all ideological belief and go with the group of people who are established in Parliament who can represent our point of view on these yeah. issues. Emery had taken libertarianism to its logical conclusion. Despite styling himself the Howard Rourke of cannabis, this was not the Ayn Rand-influenced Emery, who years earlier had stated that A lot of people who believe in free trade don't support the right to smoke marijuana, and yet the two are indivisible. Libertarianism welcomes into its tent anyone who is anti-government to one extent or another, regardless of their underlying reasons or philosophies. Unlike many other libertarians, Emery recognized that because the NDP is opposed to government prohibition of marijuana, it too is, to an extent, and for its own reasons, a libertarian party. In other words, even socialists have a place under the philosophically neutral, anti-government, libertarian tent. What Emory's libertarian critics failed to recognize was that by backing the NDP, he would bring the marijuana issue closer to the forefront of popular politics, whether or not the NDP actually won more seats. Indeed, the history of individual freedom and the dismal electoral record of the NDP gave Emory every reason to expect that the NDP would actually fail to legalize marijuana. But that failure would serve a valuable purpose. It would help Emery to convince his movement that libertarian anarchy, not electoral politics, is the road to individual freedom. The thing is, I've learned in any case that you should never worry about getting elected because I've never met anybody who was elected who really got anything done they ever wanted to get out done. I've never seen it. I don't know anybody who knows anybody. You know, I, I, I talk to politicians and I say, did you ever really get that one dream bit of legislation passed that you think makes the world a freer place? No. You never see that. They never have that answer for you. I've never met somebody who went in with high ideals who came out with the same ideals. They usually come out a foot shorter and a lot more burden, you know, that stooping bowed over shoulder look. Being a revolutionary to me is just far more fulfilling and satisfying. I'm hoping by osmosis, when they see and listen to me over and over, you pick up stuff eventually. It all becomes like, wow, I understand now. I'm getting to get it, right? And so I'm not out to change their philosophy. I want to influence their philosophy in a subtle way, where they begin to absorb what I'm all about into their personal lifestyle, kind of like a religious experience, where it becomes part of them. On April 22nd, 2004, while on a speaking tour of universities, Emery showed up at a late evening gathering of about 40 college students at a park near his hotel. Police were in attendance too, and they smelled marijuana. They arrested Emery after he admitted openly that he possessed some marijuana. Then, after a fellow attendee mentioned that Emery had passed a joint to him during the event, police charged him with trafficking. In August of 2004, he was convicted, to make an example out of the man who, just one year earlier, had shown Canadians that there was no law against the possession of marijuana, the trial judge sentenced Emery to three months in prison for the passing of a single joint. In August of 2004, Emery was locked up in a Saskatoon correctional facility while his movement held vigil outside. Before long, Emery, who had regularly attended Sunday school as a child, 
began to study the book so treasured by those who had persecuted him for advocating free speech and shopping on Sundays, the Christian Bible. The effect of that study was almost instantaneous. During a September 2004 marijuana rally in Saskatoon, Emery, from prison, gave a speech befitting a church. I have a job here that's hard work. I clean three washrooms, scrub all the floors. Now, you might think cleaning toilets for the man might be humiliating, yeah, but I don't think so. You know, I read the Bible here and I see that Jesus washed the feet of strangers, so there's no job that's demeaning if you do it with pride. And so, as I do here in prison, in response to their prohibitionist hatred, we must shine light on the darkness, truth to counter lies, and love to melt their hate. Man, I love you guys, and I love you, and I will never abandon you, and I will never let you be without hope. I love my people so much that no jail or theft to my life can alter my destiny to lead you and myself and all of us to that promised land of dignity, justice, legal and cheap marijuana for all, and acknowledgement of the cannabis culture of peace and world unity. It will happen in our lifetime. I have seen the future, man, and it is beautiful. So thank you for being my friends, guardians, keepers of the truth. I owe you very all very much and I will return your love for the rest of my life until my last breath. Upon his release from prison, Emery gave the first signs that his Bible studies would change his speeches for years to come. I learned a lot about the Bible and boy the people who oppose us will regret that <laughs> because uh, the Bible says nothing about punishing people. In fact, all the actions of the people who punish us are specifically condemned by Jesus and condemned in the Bible as the acts of a pernicious judgmental human beings of which you're not allowed to be. You know, that's God's job to be judgmental. Our job is to just bring life, liberty, freedom, happiness for all concerned and everyone we meet. You want to see how to rile people up about marijuana, you just quote the Bible and that will get them all going. I said, nowhere in the Bible does Jesus say that persecute the marijuana people. No, that would be the Romans. They were the bad guys. You see, the Romans were persecuting the meek and, 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 and nowhere in the Ten Commandments is it again drug. Nowhere in the Old Testament. In fact, Jesus himself prefers wine to water. All right, so he's kind of given his okay uh, with the holy anointing oil containing cannabis and uh, preference for uh, alcohol. Um, after all, he was the people's man. And, but nowhere does he say persecute the marijuana people. And so, you know, when I explained on the John Gormley show that it was anti-Christian to be against marijuana, that just set them crazy. They just blew their minds, right? And uh, so that was a lot of fun. You know what I learned in kindergarten? I learned a song that can give us a place to stand, give us a place to grow, and we will call this province Ontario Area. Oh, they taught me that in school. They taught me that in school. I went to Sunday school where they taught me that it was God's gift that we should use everything He gave us. In Sunday school, they taught me to plant seeds. Genesis 1:29. In kindergarten, they told me it was my provincial responsibility to plant seeds. This is the place to grow. I'm only doing what my parents taught me, my Sunday school teacher taught me, my teachers taught me. So don't blame me for how I turned out. Blame the system! The Bible appeared to have more than an effect upon the content of his speeches. It also helped him to give a meaning to the suffering he had endured in prison and that he expected to endure again. Ah, guys aren't spiritual people. Anybody who says that is just making an excuse for mysticism, right? Because they don't have an answer, right? So they ascribe some spiritual quality to it. That there is this one thing, there is this one incident in my life that cannot be explained in other than that some extraordinary higher power has taken a hand in my life. In 1977, I got a call from a woman who collapsed right in front of my store. Like, just collapsed. And, uh, and passed out and they took her to a hospital and she was in a coma for three weeks. And Then she called me up three weeks later, she said, I've just gotten out of hospital and I've never met you, Mr. Emery, but I have to tell you something. When I walked in front of your store, I saw three visions about you in the space of those fractions of a second. I've never met you, but I know your name and I know what you look like and I know everything about you and I'm never going to come to meet you. I just want to tell you this and I'm hoping I can get this out of my head. She said, the first thing I saw is I saw the dollar sign. There's something very important about money. You're going to be very, very, very skilled or something very significant about money. And she said, and the second thing I see is a mind like a steel trap. And she says, do you have one of those? And I thought, well, I've always thought I was good at Jeopardy and stuff like that. But anyway, whatever. <laughs> but she said, and the fourth one is I see a leaf. It looks like a maple leaf, but it isn't a maple leaf. It's got ridged edges. So she goes on about this leaf being very important. She says, this leaf is important to your whole destiny. It's important to a whole bunch of people. And she said, and you're going to lead a group of people, a big multitude of people, under the banner of this leaf. And of course, I realized later on she was alluding to the marijuana leaf. 
And I feel that I've been, it's been prophesied that I would come and do this, that I would take all this energy and all these people around the world and raise people to a height where we could get the acknowledgement that we were seeking it and freed from the bondage. So it's not even a personal quest. It's like I'm an instrument. And, and I've been guided, and it's been foretold all along that this would, be what I would, this would be what I would do. I have no other explanation than somebody somewhere has a design for me.